In the scrambled language of rocks, the ancient geology of North America's Atlantic coast speaks to us of how our past pounded our present into shape. Did you know that parts of this coastline were once joined with Africa's? Geologic twins moving to the same beat. Or that hundreds of millions of years ago, a landmass crashed into Newfoundland's shores, bearing evidence of the oldest animal ecosystem our planet has ever known. Or that on these cliffs, so high you can almost touch the sky, you can walk on the deepest parts of an ancient ocean. It's all part of a geologic journey into the mysteries of our Atlantic coast. North American continent of ours was molded by mighty forces, whose very existence in the deep past was first proved here on the Atlantic coast. Even in sunlight, Canada's Grosmorne National Park in western Newfoundland has a brooding presence shot through with beauty and mystery. Much of that mystery can be traced to the Tablelands, a dark plateau towering over 2,000 feet above the Atlantic. It stands alone, a stranger in a strange land, alien among its lush and hilly neighbors. It was precisely that look of not belonging that first attracted the attention of a stranger to Canada himself. Back then, Robert Stevens had just arrived from England. It was the early 60s, and he was 22. He'd answered an ad for grad students placed in the English Sunday papers by Newfoundland's Memorial University. And suddenly there he was, mapping the west coast of Newfoundland and loving every minute. We had many a pleasant summer here, walking through these rocks, just trying to understand what was going on half a billion years ago. Little did he think that he was about to play a crucial role in one of the major scientific breakthroughs of the 20th century. It all started in Lobster Cove, trying to figure out what happened here millions of years ago at the edge of the ancient American continent Bob took rock samples back to the lab for analysis. The results astonished him. I was expecting to see bits of volcanic rock, bits of granite and stuff like that. And it was a great surprise to come across a mineral which I'd never seen before. It was um, a beautiful brownish red mineral, high relief. I uh, no idea what it was. Is it mineralized at all? Uh, nobody's really looked, so I don't know the answer to that. Brendan Murphy, professor of earth sciences at Nova Scotia's Francis Xavier University, has been Bob's friend for over a decade. Exactly. Just looking at the folds here. Bob had his detective hat on that day. What he found in the sediments in western Newfoundland was this mineral called chromite. And chromite is a very rare mineral in the continental crust. It does occur, but it's rare. And so he immediately put on his antenna 
and realize that uh, chromite is a mineral that's far more common in oceanic crust and mantle than it is in continental crust. The fact that chromite was in the sediment meant it must be even older than the rocks Bob was examining. They had to be older than 450 million years old. In fact, they turned out to be 485 million years old. But how had part of the inaccessible ocean floor arrived up on the Earth's surface in the first place? Sensing he was onto something, Stevens followed one of the first rules of geological sleuthing. Identify what you're looking at and what sort of environments they formed in, and then try and place them back where they originally were deposited or formed. The sediment was coming from somewhere higher up, something that was being eroded. The tablelands were being eroded. They were yielding sediment, and that sediment was being transported down a slope and ended up into uh, the rocks at Lobster Grove. And so Bob turned his steps towards those high, barren mountains. And sure enough, it was the same mineral, the same red, deep, browny red color. It's unmistakable. So it meant that there was something very wrong with how these rocks were being interpreted. Up till then, most people assumed the tablelands were molten material, which had oozed up from deep inside the earth and cooled and crystallized into rock. As the 60s progressed, a debate, simmering for centuries, was coming to a boil. Some called it continental drift. Others, plate tectonics. This held that the Earth's hard shell consists of two kinds of crust, continental and oceanic. That crust sits on roughly 20 traveling plates whose journey is controlled from deep below the crust. Here in the mantle, the red hot engine which sends plates crashing across the globe slamming them into supercontinents and splitting them apart. This story stars an ancient ocean which no one could prove existed. By the mid-60s, plate tectonics had become a viable theory, but one being applied mostly to ocean floor no older than 200 million years. Anything older than that is being constantly recycled. Propelled up from the mantle, magma intrudes through cracks in the ocean floor, pushing it apart and spreading outwards, the driving beat of plate tectonics. As it cools, its older edges are eventually dragged back below, making oceanic crust older than 200 million years very rare. Geology's steep learning slope was on the verge of a huge advance. It was a turbulent, exciting time. An army of naysayers against a small group of plate tectonic believers of whom Bob was one. Another was renowned geophysicist J. Tuzo Wilson. What Tuzo Wilson did, a major leap forward, was he used the geological record of Newfoundland uh, to propose very provocatively that Western Newfoundland and Southeastern Newfoundland were once on opposite sides of an ancient ocean that existed between 600 and 400 million years ago. On the eastern side of that ocean, later named Iapetus, lay the whole eastern coast from ancient Newfoundland to Florida. But Tuzo Wilson's theory remained a theory. He hadn't yet produced proof of this giant ocean's existence. Increasingly, Bob was convinced that proof lay in his hands, in the chromite-laden mantle material he'd traced from Lobster Cove to the Tablelands. 
Since it formed here, under the ocean floor, Bob's mantle material could not have oozed up from deep within the earth, as previously thought. Instead, tectonic forces heaved it up and out, part of an ancient seabed, broken off as Iapetus struggled and writhed as its death throes began. It looks like an alien landscape because it really is an, an alien landscape. The rocks we're sitting on originated deep beneath the ocean floor of an ocean that existed half a billion years ago. Half a billion years ago, a new supercontinent, Pangaea, was beginning to form. Its growth would spell the death of the Iapetus Ocean. It would have looked like a series of migrating islands approaching North America. The ocean was closed, essentially, and it would have uplifted and we would have seen it slowly coming out of the water and seen a great sheet of oceanic material covering the whole of uh, this part of Newfoundland. Maybe as much as 500 kilometers in length. This is the first bit of oceanic material discovered in North America. Um, it was the first time that anyone had recognized and definitely said you can walk on the mantle in North America. And that's important because to drill to the mantle is actually far more difficult than flying to the moon. They got, they've got to the moon or many years ago, but they still haven't drilled down to the mantle. That's, that's still the future. What the tableland represents is a vital piece of the preserved remnant of part of that oceanic crust. And so it's like anything that's rare, it's extremely precious laboratory for that sort of study. And we now know that that crust and the mantle that's also preserved there is uh, about 500 million years old. That's uh, much, much older than any of the oceanic crust and mantle that's currently beneath our modern oceans. Uh, so it's a very, very important uh, piece of uh, geological real estate indeed. On its arrival from the depths of Neptune's realm, this exotic immigrant placed a vast research lab at the feet of science. And so it also set the stage for uh, a great focus of uh, the world's attention on Newfoundland geology. And geologists came from all over the world to look at this laboratory of how plate tectonics worked in the deep past. But uh, if you trace it back to where it all started, it all started back to the combination in the 1960s of Tuzo Wilson's provocative ideas and um, Bob following up on that. So we know that Avalon was uh, 20... In the space of just over a decade, plate tectonics had grown from a controversial abstraction to a respected working theory. And it was Bob Stevens who'd helped bring that theory to life and put flesh on its theoretical bones. It's proved as important to geology as Einstein's theory was to physics, and it would be used to help solve yet another Atlantic coast riddle, this one involving 500 million year old life. Plate tectonics helped answer an old question of Darwin's, an answer found here at Mistaken Point in southern Newfoundland. That answer arrived on the back of a landmass from off Africa's coast, which whacked into eastern North America. Newfoundland's Avalon Peninsula is part of that ancient landmass. When it washed up here at Mistaken Point, this tall, rugged outcrop carried priceless cargo on its back. Fossils, petrified remains of ancient life forms, lie scattered here in their thousands. Over half a billion years old, they predate a geological period called the Cambrian, famous as a time when life forms suddenly blossomed. 
and they provide the solution to a dilemma which daunted Darwin. These are the diamonds of the fossil world. This is where everything began. Paleontologist Guy Narbonne of Ontario's Queen's University and Jim Galing of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide are experts on these particular fossils. Every time we come here, I think you can agree with me, Guy, we find new material. You walk on these rocks and the first thought is, wow, look at that. And it's so perfect. And there's another one and another one. And then you begin to come to grips with literally thousands of specimens that there are littering this surface. The oldest animal fossils in the world. They're the earliest form of complex or multicellular life ever found. And their discovery has turned this remote spot into a shrine drawing geologists, paleontologists, and amateur rock hounds from all over the world. Today's group includes enthusiasts from as far away as Scandinavia and China. From St. John's, Newfoundland's capital city, it's a three-hour drive to the tip of the Avalon Peninsula and mistaken point. Here it is. It's a Oh, wow. this is Well, we might, might have more filaments. Wait a little okay. Much bigger spindles. Excellent spindle. Yeah, all spindles over the surface. Nice. Oh, look at the Rangi more filaments, sir. Yeah, see that? Yeah, yeah. 85% of our species are showing this rangimore. This is the fundamental unit mm -hmm. that built up life. They're looking at the oldest visible animal ecosystem anywhere in the world. A complex community of large marine creatures who lived and died in the same spot. And being soft-bodied, they would normally have left no trace of their existence behind. They didn't have shells and bones and spines. That makes it really quite weird because for hundreds of years, people believed that such sorts of creatures could not be preserved. And yet here they are, embossed on the sea floor. Unfortunately, Darwin never made it to mistaken point. More like that. This would have been Darwin's delight. Darwin spent an entire chapter in The Origin of Species wondering why there were no ancestors to the Cambrian uh, fossils of shells and bones and tracks and trails. Darwin's dilemma was that without proof of pre-Cambrian life, his evolutionary yes. theory was vulnerable to attack. Yet he believed that long before the Cambrian, the world swarmed with living creatures. But where were they? Or were they entirely bush structure with a yeah. whole tangle of arms? And we're just seeing one. And when you get to the top, can I ask you all to take off your shoes so that we do not scratch up the surface? From Darwin's to our own obsession with family photos, we're all on the hunt for our past. All of us are much more interested in looking at some dusty old photographs in Aunt Mabel's books if we think that they might be pictures of our own ancestors. And that's one of the reasons why people search, to try to find origins for ourselves and for everything else around us. Kit Ward, a retired teacher, lives here. She's one of a group of volunteers working to preserve these pictures of our evolutionary history. We were awestruck. You know, wow, <laughs> it, you know, this is on our doorstep and we really didn't realize just how great it was. I still have difficulty trying to understand 565 million years. That's a lot of time. Named after the Ediacara Hills in Australia, fossils like these have been found in 30 places around the world. But nowhere are they as plentiful or as well exposed as here. Here you have a wow. That's beautiful. 
<laughs> and they were alive before the Cambrian. The kind of creatures that we get in the Cambrian were things that are related to uh, worms and crabs and shrimps and various other kinds of shellfish and had all the evidence of having armour and protection. Their ancestors that we see in the Ediacaran time are much simpler and they show no evidence that they could take chunks out of each other. Uh, but apart from that, there are mysteries uh, globular shaped or... or so far, 30 different fossil types have been discovered. Their fractal forms resemble fern leaves. Thin, branch-like fingers feeling outwards to branch again. Others are circular, disc-like. The very oldest thing that we would call an Ediacaran fossil looks like a pepperoni pizza that's been dumped on the seafloor. These things even have a crust around the outside and they have objects in the center and we have no idea what they are. They do know that in their time, these creatures made up 85% of all animal life. And that they formed in the dark, deep waters of an unnamed sea off the coast of Africa over half a billion years ago. A cold sea surrounded by volcanic islands. While they were alive on the seafloor, there's a giant volcanic eruption, and it spilled this ash about a centimeter thick all over it. And that completely entombed them. They died where they lived. And every fine detail is preserved in the bottom of the ash, The sort of experience you have here is like going to Pompeii and seeing those plaster casts of the poor people who were engulfed, smothered by this hot volcanic ash. Now that was on land. This was under the ocean. So by the time it sank to the seafloor, it certainly wasn't hot. But it acted just in the same way. This volcanic ash settled on these creatures, flattened them, floored them on the seafloor, and then formed a crust, a death mask over the top of it. The ash preserved these soft-bodied creatures and so helped solve Darwin's dilemma by proving, as he had so brilliantly predicted, that the Precambrian did indeed swarm with living creatures. And today, it allows us to speculate on the nature of these almost ancestors. These organisms, these creatures could not have been seaweeds because there was no light on the seafloor. Some people think they look like uh, fish skeletons because they sort of vaguely look like the backbone of a fish. But there's no evidence of head, there's no evidence of a tail, there's no evidence of any kind of fins. There is nothing in here that had a mouth, nothing that had a brain, nothing that could even move. They lived their lives extracting nutrients from the seawater. Whatever these creatures are, they don't fit the model of most of the creatures that you actually see in, in the ocean today. And that makes it even more exciting because not only are we seeing some of the oldest life on Earth, we're seeing what might be a really fantastic experiment in getting large. This is the first time where life got big, right? And that is important to us. But the experiment failed probably because these large, soft-bodied creatures lack the ability to compete or to prey on others. The Ediacaran was the only time on Earth where organisms really live peaceably, just live side by side. This was the time when the lamb lay down with the lion, figuratively speaking. We are the progeny of the time when life got to be um, large, multi-celled. If it wasn't for that, the world today would just be slime world, bacteria, bugs. And it hadn't been for three billion years before this. Something happened in the time underneath this life which sparked a change in, in life on Earth. And forever after, it really never looked back. 
And we would not be on this planet if it hadn't been for what happened in this Ediacaran period. Recently, the geological time scale established in Darwin's day was altered to include a new period. And we name it the Ediacaran. It's named after these. Now, this is a momentous thing. There used to be 11 geological periods, or had been for 130 years. Now there's a 12th one. That's the equivalent of finding a new planet in the solar system. I think we better go. The scientists leave. But Kit Ward remains, the self-appointed guardian of the fossils one type of which was found by her son. Now it's been given their family name, the Charnia Wardai. Slowly, as an old ocean died, a new supercontinent formed. But as in any relationship with too many partners, this union was doomed to instability. For eons, though, Pangaea lay on the equator, and in the sizzling heat, gave birth to a profusion of life. Nowadays, the mighty Atlantic dominates the coast of eastern North America. But 400 million years ago, the Atlantic had not yet been born. Our world had not yet assumed its familiar shape. These cliffs in Nova Scotia belonged elsewhere. Their radiant slopes glow even now, as if, banked deep inside, the embers of a warmer past still burn. A past when all eastern North America nestled beside Africa, and crocodiles and dinosaurs roamed a sweltering supercontinent. Today, the bones of those creatures are still being excavated in their thousands from the cliffs along Nova Scotia's Bay of Fundy. We think that maybe the dinosaurs were buried in a mudslide because there's so many packed together so close, but that's part of what we're trying to figure out right now. Looking at the layers of rock will help us find that out. There's a major bone bed here and paleontologist Tim Fedak is uncovering the chest cavity of a dinosaur from the Jurassic with his colleague, Kathy Goodwin. Hi, how are you doing? Really good, actually. Good stuff coming out. This rock's coming away pretty easily. Make some good progress. So you're making several channels through there. What I'm doing here is uh, just carefully working around series of ribs that are oriented along this plane here, and they're, they seem to be all articulated. We're assuming that the bones of the back of a, a dinosaur are actually just up on the cliff there, so we're just working our way up towards them and exposing them very slowly. Here, I'll expose some things here. That's an isolated piece up there. Mm -hmm. It's in line with the ones. Some of the most interesting and varied discoveries here at Parsborough Beach were made by a self-taught rock hound. The whole rock was made up of fish scales. After a childhood injury, Eldon George dedicated himself to geological detective work. Today, he's 76 and the proud owner of the Parsborough Rock Shop. These are baby crocodile footprint and you can see the back foot and the front foot now this is a dinosaur footprint it has three toes quite a large dinosaur this one is a crocodile footprint and a very rare one because it has skin impression 
on the bottom of his feet. In the same area over 20 years ago, Paul Olson and a colleague uncovered a monster graveyard, brimming with dinosaur skulls, teeth, and jaws. It turned out to be the world's largest collection of fossils from a crucial period in the Earth's history. A time boundary, millions of years ago when the Triassic was ending and the Jurassic just beginning. And that was a remarkable find. It was the best one ever found in North America. But for Olson, a paleoecologist from New York's Columbia University, its implications extended beyond the thrill of discovery. I realized that this was, in fact, a major find, telling us something unique about the time period, something that we hadn't known before. The evidence pointed to a mass extinction, the annihilation of whole species, including the competitors of the dinosaurs. There were none of the familiar kinds of organisms that we had come to know from the Triassic. They were all gone. There was a catastrophic mass extinction that wiped out more than 50% of all the kinds of creatures that were on Earth. And the survivors are what we find right here in this area, including these small crocodiles, the dinosaurs, the mammal-like reptiles. And these were the creatures that repopulated the Earth. These were the creatures that eventually gave us the modern world. But we find them here in abundance due in part to the fact that the rifting of the continents produced a series of little basins which acted like holes in the ground that trapped the remains of animals and plants that lived in this area. So it's plate tectonics itself that gave us this wonderful fossil assemblage. Around the time of the mass extinction, signs of strain in Pangaea's unwieldy union were starting to show. Along volatile fault lines, volcanoes muttered and heaved. It would take millions of years for the marriage to dissolve, but the cracks were widening. About 200 million years ago, there was a very, very major volcanic activity, mainly centered uh, down in the southern United States, but a uh, major fingers of it and arms of it uh, reached up into uh, maritime Canada and thick volcanic flows erupted on the surface. Determined to force continents apart, a young upstart ocean was knocking on their door, demanding to be born. You can see all around the cliffs around Parsboro, the remnants of these ancient volcanic eruptions, the early failed attempts to open up an ocean. Of course, had it been successful then, a lot of Nova Scotia would have uh, taken off with Africa and would now would be on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, that early uh, attempt was not successful. Lava flows are consistent with the breakup of a supercontinent. But to what extent did they cause the mass extinction? Such questions prompted Olson to leave Nova Scotia and take off for another continent. Africa, which lay in childhood beside eastern North America and now lives 5,000 miles away. Yet evidence of that violent family breakup can still be read in the volcanic rock of the Atlas Mountains. Since then, like twins separated at birth, They've gone their different ways. Today, Morocco, perched on the northwest margin of Africa, remains just a hop and a skip from the equator. A country vibrating with heat and color, music, and ancient culture. The 
souk in Marrakesh seems a shade more exotic than a maritime market. But the family resemblance returns in the warm red of the Atlas Mountains. The Atlas take their name from the ancient Greek god, whose colossal strength stopped the sky from falling by holding up the heavens. It's in these sister rocks that Olson and his colleagues, Mohammed Et Tuhani and Jessica Whiteside of Brown University, Rhode Island, hope to find answers to questions relating to mass extinctions and their long-term implications. We knew that we had a mass extinction, but we had no really good idea of how it occurred, the specific mechanism. Uh, what was the killing mechanism? What we have to do is to look at pollen and spores of the kinds of plants that were around and the plants that went extinct. We have to look at various different types of carbon that are preserved in the rock. I'm looking for the fingerprint of the carbon isotopes as they're recorded in these fossils. Paleoecologist Whiteside believes the volcanic outpourings at the time of the mass extinction caused a disastrous change in climate. So far, you see a dramatic change in the relationship of these isotopes, which tells you that there's a disruption or instability in the carbon cycle. And I'm looking at these multiple sections so that I can say that this is actually a global instability and not one that just reflects local regional changes. Whiteside's evidence points to climate change on a global scale. Huge amounts of carbon dioxide trapped in the Earth's atmosphere, pushing up temperatures during the Triassic Jurassic from 40 to 55 degrees Celsius. Looks like there's some striations on it. Lava flows alone would have produced huge amounts of CO2. Triassic in East North America. The lava flows themselves were probably a result of the final episode of stretching between North America and Africa. They erupted in almost unbelievable spatial scale, all the way from southern France to southwestern Brazil, from eastern North America to central West Africa, an enormous area, millions of square kilometers, in fact, about 10 million square kilometers, one of the largest events in Earth history. And they, these lavas came out of gigantic fissures that themselves, individually, were 500 to 1,000 kilometers long. And there were many of these things. And they produced these enormous curtains of lava that went thousands of meters into the air. The history of life has been punctuated by several events in which there were also climatic catastrophes associated with mass extinctions, and in particular with this climatic catastrophe and super greenhouse associated with the Triassic Jurassic, uh, in the such high levels of carbon dioxide and such high temperatures that all organisms in interior parts of continental regions are um, not able to exist. And we're seeing parallels with our human species because we've been around for a very, very short amount of time. And in that amount of time, we've managed to burn so much fossil fuel to destroy so much habitat. We've become this sort of super predator that we may be heading ourselves into a sixth mass extinction and also actually creating a geological force in that we're altering the climatic system so much. Part of Whiteside's task is to try to measure how long it took the Earth to regenerate. There's no real way to know how long it would take for the environment and organisms to recover from this type of thing. So we look at the past, and my work has shown that it takes organisms something like 10 million years to recover. I think so. 
And the only hope that we have is that throughout all of life's history, 99% of all species ever to exist on life have been wiped out. But life always is able to return and to become even more diverse than it was previously. As Pangaea finally splits apart, tearing North America from Africa's side, that demanding young ocean bursts through into life. It would be called the Atlantic, after those red Atlas Mountains. And as it reshaped the world, it usurped the area once occupied by the ancient Iapetus Ocean, whose name means father of Atlantic. The opening of that ocean changed the plate dynamics throughout the world. Uh, the Pacific Ocean particularly started to, to uh, contract more rapidly, and the west coast of North America, uh, Canada and the United States, uh, it changed their environments completely because uh, a whole process of subduction really started in, in, in a rapid fashion along the west coast and is continuing to this day. And so that is why the west coast of North America is both volcanically active and prone to earthquakes, and particularly in the San Andreas Fault region. And that tectonic instability started when the Atlantic Ocean began to open. It's like a beat, a pulse, that's been operating throughout the Earth history. There's pulses of volcanic activity and pulses of nutrients available to the oceans. And the underpinning of all this is plate tectonic activity. If you liken uh, the Earth's history to uh, a song with a very strong beat, we need to understand those beats and rhythms so we can understand the rate of natural change. Well, similarly, there's something that we as humans are doing to the evolution of our planet. We should be identified as a skip in the beat of the planet, in the natural beat of the planet. But first, we need to be able to understand the Earth's beats and rhythms so we can identify that skip.